we're going to talk this week specifically, we're going to get started talking about machines. And so this is, we've got this little pyramid of topics that we're going to be addressing over the next four weeks intermittently with some other things. And so we're going to try and go after this one little piece at the time. This week, we're going to stay focused on the bottom left corner. We're going to talk about the physical structure of projects and sort of what the like architecture that you need to make those happen to build these sorts of things. And then we're going to work on the other pieces all, all, in, all in pieces and parts. So this is going to take a little while, but we're going to build our way towards trying to understand all of these different parts through applications, which is going to give us some context and it's going to give us things to, to think about as we're developing. Um, these projects are going to take on a life of their own and they're, they're going to be weird and there's lots of different opportunity for what, they're, what they could be. I put in the foundations chat that my first instinct says that we could do two and I'm totally open for any suggestions or any changes completely. But if I were to wave a magic wand and say, this is what you should do. It would probably be one group takes on the garden project, which is more like physical hands-on moving parts, a little less code, perhaps a little, uh, a little less CNC like where you're watering the plants throughout Make Haven with tubes and, and fittings, and then a little bit of code to run some pumps, but not, not anything too crazy. And then another group that's doing a light painting machine where it's input an SVG and then it draws it with an LED in space and you put a long exposure camera on it and it captures that as a picture, which I think would be really cool. There's, there's, what's up? Yeah, I'm totally aware of what Lior has as a system. I'd say, oh yeah, good question. Am I aware of the system that Lior has already built for watering the plants and are we gonna replace it, integrate, whatever? My, the short answer is I think the smart move is to build right alongside it. And if we find that ours works well, then we can shut down Lior's and use, use the one that's built by us. If not, Lior's is sort of workable. It spills every so often, which is part of what we're trying to solve. Lior did a great job, by the way. Uh, it was a one man effort, but I think that we can, we can do something that's a little bit more clever to solve some of these problems. So there's a ton of different interesting opportunities and neat things to explore. Yeah, well, let me, when we get to show and tell, I'll make sure that I can pull up an example of light painting. It was a, it, it's a good uh, art project. If you're doing photography, you have a real long exposure thing. If you've ever seen someone draw pictures with a sparkler in a photo, that's exactly what it is. For those people, I understand the actual mechanism. The mechanism would just be like an LED that gives off light and then you move it around like the, like the laser moves its laser head or like the CNC plotter moves its plotter knife. Part of figuring it out is the whole is the whole bit. I don't have a packaged answer. It could be really neat if it was huge and like sits on a, across the wall. It could be really neat if it was like in a box with a rigging so that you had a place to mount a camera. Like there's a ton of ways to make it look neat. Um, and you know, whichever is the right thing for the group to consider is probably the way to go. But we're gonna talk about like, how do you go um, how do you go from there? Do we have a visual for the light painting machine? There's one in the slides, it's coming. So the visual for the light painting machines. Okay, so what are the topics for this week? How, how are we gonna even get close to entertaining ideas like that or if we have other ideas that we wanna entertain? And so we're gonna talk a little bit more big picture, sort of machine, how do you make a machine? How do you go from an idea to a thing? So some, uh, some machine ideation. And then what are the teamwork dynamics that we're gonna try and employ as we're looking at all these things? Then we'll talk a little bit about how do you build the structure of these machines? And we've got an example I pulled, there's a, a 3D printer graveyard in the back of Makehaven. And we're totally gonna to look at that and see what all those 3D printer graveyard pieces are useful for and how they can help us. And then we'll build some vocabulary, some terms, and we'll get started. So in, whoops, hopping through things head back for the for the idea of a machine let's say you have a machine idea that you want to turn into a thing there's a whole series of processes and machines when you look at them at first like a 3d printer at first glance looking at it can look like a complicated item but the more you stare at it the more you wrap your head around what each part is and sort of how they fit together the more it turns into just a series of small pieces that are put together in an interesting way and so the main question that we need to do as we're thinking about our machines is what do you want them to accomplish? And it may feel like that's not doing a whole lot to answer that question. What do you want it to do? 
but that's going to be a big deciding factor in what you're actually working towards, especially when you're thinking about what's the end effector or what's the thing on the machine that's going to do the business part of it. Like in the, in a, in the garden watering thing, it's going to be the pumps that push the water around, right? That's the end effector. In a 3D printer, it's the heated nozzle that, ooze, that heats up the plastic as it oozes out. In a CNC, it's the end mill that is spinning on the end, that, that rotor. And so all of those different pieces are definitely parts of building a machine where you want to take all those things into effect. I really like this particular image. That's one of the early consumer 3D printer models that you could, that you could get, um, but it doesn't have an end effector on it at all. I just put that weird shape there. That's sort of where the printer nozzle would go, but the rest of it is all the structure that it takes to build and move around a 3D printer, but without the 3D printer parts. That's just all the, the you know, there's CNC motors or these black and gray things here. This is a lead screw. There's these bearings or these linear rods, some belts, all that sort of stuff. It's like all the structure that it takes to build one of those machines, but not the, the end effect or the business part of the machine. But this is a good place to start to wonder about how do we want to build it? What do we want our thing to look like? Do we need a full three axis motion system or, or in the case of the garden, you probably don't need any of that. And you're just going to have motors that are in, in line with tubes. There's a lot of different ways to have machines. They don't all have to look like a CNC. And so as, as we're doing that, one of the big pieces, one of the strategies that we're going to employ as we start to entertain the ideas of these things further and further is the idea of spiral design. So, and, and we talked about this all the way back in week two, I think at the very, at the very beginning. It's amazing how this spirals back. Uh -huh. <laughs> Never mind uh, how it spins back on us, but it totally works. This is it, originally, I, I think this strategy has military origins. I looked it up and 50% of NASA missions to Mars have complete failure, not partial complete failures, 50% of them to Mars, which is incredible that there's this idea on that, that you want things to work perfectly the first time, but as you're building and developing, you need to plan for that to not always work. And so you'll make tests, you'll try things out and it'll spiral up. You'll get better and better as you try more things, but you wanna keep testing and pushing the boundary of your idea, right? If you're imagining a, a garden watering plant, the first thing would be like, can I turn a pump on? Sure, can I, can, then can I move water around? And then how far can I move the water? Can I control when and how the water moves? Do, how, how can I test if water, if enough water came out? All of those different questions that follow along are really important pieces that would help you spiral an idea. And each time you go through it, reflecting on that is really helpful. And when you do it by yourself, it, it can be good. Some people are really good internal reflectors, uh, but a lot of the time that's where the team really helps to be able to process what happened nice and slowly with people around to make sense of it is really important. And a big part about spiral design is that if you do it right, you're trying to build in such a way so that even if you had to stop right now, you'd always have something that was deliverable. Even if it wasn't the perfect, I wanna put it in a cardboard box and sell it for $300 kind of product, it would still be something that would deliver an end result. So in the case of a garden monitor, maybe that's one pump, you know, like it's not a whole array of them. It doesn't have a great web interface. It's got a switch that's on and off and it's, it's not necessarily the nicest thing in the world but you work your way towards it each time getting better and better trying to improve those ideas. The, the next thing to think about is teamwork. And I, this is, you are all perfectly functional adults in a world. I don't need to explain the, the ins and outs of teamwork to you. But I think the one thing that's interesting is that teamwork in a makerspace, when you're going after a project that's kind of for fun is that it's got its own dynamic, right? Everybody's gonna have perspective uh, we're, you're, you're not here for, for, because you got a degree in it and a college thing. Uh, and, and when you're building something that's as creative as the machines that hopefully we're going to be making over the next couple of weeks are, nobody is an authority on this, right? Everybody's going to have ideas and perspectives to present, things to try out, uh, good ideas to look at. And just having fresh eyes on a problem that you've been struggling over is often really, really helpful. Even if, even if it's something that you're not necessarily an expert in, asking those good questions is really more of the driving force 
than having somebody who comes in and knows all of the answers. That's often more of a problem than it's helpful. Uh, just so that we're clear. Plus the, the great part about teamwork in a space like this is that when you work with people and you get to share their experiences, and this has been part of the charm of the entire course, is you get to learn from everybody else's successes and failures at the same time as yours. So it's not just you trudging through these goals, it's you getting to see how other people are also working on it, what their successes and failures are, and then sort of how you can learn from each other having those experiences, which is, which is I think probably the secret sauce of this entire course is that we're all getting to learn alongside each other as a group, which makes it better. Uh, so that, that said, those are sort of the like big ideas and philosophical pieces to take a look at while we're talking about machines. But now let's, let's drill down on how do you build this thing? Or right, where's the structure come in? We're gonna focus on the bottom left corner of our triangle and just think a little bit about how do you get started? Our first prototypes are gonna be quick and messy and not, and not like clear or straightforward. Resurrecting a 3D printer is totally uh, the way to go. We're just gonna try and, and do all of those things to, to see what this turns into. And as we get better with all of these pieces, they'll come together. But we're gonna stay focused on like, how do you physically build things so that you have some structure to work with. Then next week and the week after, we'll talk about active components. And then we'll talk about how do you build a good code base as we go on further. You'll like work your way in that direction as time happens. Hello world. <laughs> yep, all right. Uh, so as we're talking about here, one of the things for how do you build a machine is that there's basically no right answer. Uh, the two examples that I have in the bottom left and the bottom right up here are both MakerBot 3D printers. MakerBot is a big famous thing, a big famous uh, company, maybe not big. They were bought by Stratasys, which is a big 3D printing company. And they came out of New York City. It was originally three friends working in a makerspace, not that different from this one. And so they started building their own 3D printers and then selling them. The early ones were made out of wood because it's an accessible material. They could laser cut it. That totally looks like a laser cut piece with some trap nut joinery. Like there's the little tabs to align it. There's a bolt that goes in. If you look really closely on the side, they've got a little slot for the nut to fit in there. This is an early MakerBot replicator that you could have bought made out of wood. Wood is, is delightfully forgiving. It's got a little stretch and bend. You don't have to be quite as intense as with metal. It's a great place to get started. And for a like, number of years, and I don't know the number, but let's say five years, they sold their 3D printers like this made out of wood. Right? They were selling real 3D printers that you'd buy and put on a desk like our Prusa or the the Mark Forge, or, well, not the Mark Forge, that's a much nicer one, but, the, but 3D printers like that made out of wood. You can also build with metal. Both of these are totally valid. And even in this professional company that sold thousands and thousands of printers over the years, they have a long and storied tradition of building the early ones with wood as a perfectly viable alternative. Moving to metal is perhaps better for making them in mass scale. You know, you can crank out a bunch of metal pieces a little bit faster. Uh, and, and it certainly has a higher show value for the final product. This is more of a, I would like to buy a 3D printer and it just work. The one on the left came as a kit in a box and you had to assemble it once it got to your place. So there's, there's certainly a difference there. We're probably gonna stay more on the left-hand side of this whole game as we're working on these projects. And that is completely and totally fine. There's a lot that you can do in here and this can still look really nice even if you're playing with what you think may not be the most professional materials. You can still do a lot there. But it brings in laser cutting and lots of designs that, that make, that, that fill in our spaces pretty actively, that, that use the skills that we've been practicing. Uh, but when you're thinking about wood versus metal and how do you build a machine, one, one good question is how rigid does it need to be between wood and metal? Uh, that's a very relevant question. And it turns out there's only a certain number of times where you really need to have a fully solid rigid machine. There's a fair amount of time where you can be a little bit more, uh, let's say flexible with it all. If you have a vibrating or fast moving machine, something that's got a CNC end mill, something that is gonna shake a lot as it runs, those sorts of things often need to be more rigid. And so like the bridge port in a lot of ways, not in all of the ways, but in a lot of ways is sort of a scaled up drill press, right? It's, it's got a spinny bit, it's gonna be cutting through things. 
you can put a Forstner bit into a regular drill press and cut into wood. Uh, and you can do essentially the same thing on a bridge port. It's just scaled much, much higher because the forces acting there are much larger as well, right? And so for a machine that's gonna have that high vibration, high forces, those sorts of things, you're gonna need to think about that much rigidity to make it work. And sometimes if you're building, if you were building your own circuit, uh, circuit board milling CNC, you'd have to be worried about that because too much player vibration across all of the machine's body and you can start breaking bits, right? Your end effector wouldn't work because you don't have enough rigidity. And so in some machines, that's really critical, like the bridge port and like, and like CNC's if you're trying to build one of those. It's pretty much why we should not shoot for those. Those are a lot of times if you have a really tightly game, uh, tightly defined machine, you're gonna have propagating errors. Like in the laser cutters, if they vibrated as they moved around, any vibration or motion of the mirrors would propagate from mirror to mirror to mirror and you get a compounding error. The earlier it happens in the chain of two or three mirrors that happen in the laser, the worse it gets when you get down to the cutting end. So there's some strategy in choosing machines and projects that are workable for us. Like that sand, sand table looks like a great option. You don't have a propagating set of errors. It's not a lot of load force. The light drawing thing, and we're gonna look at what that is in a minute, I promise. Uh, that is a low force activity. The pumps for the water, you're pushing around water, which is heavy stuff, don't get me wrong. But if we're pushing around small amounts, it's not gonna be that heavy. It's not gonna be that high stress of, a, of an event. And so high rigidity in a machine is something that you could need if you have a really long running process like a very long acting drawback, you're gonna to need to have some level of stability in it. Mostly we're gonna say like, this is our first go around, let's try and avoid that. So how about, when is it less important? Well, there's some cases where you're actively avoiding rigidity in your robot, like in the top right there, that is a soft robot, a little gripper. And there's those balloons that inflate all by pumping air pressure in. That's a little hand that can grab things and it really is developed by NASA and Stanford are working actively on these for space exploration pieces and, and maybe like search and rescue where these machines are powered differently. They can be run underwater without a problem. There's a whole lot of interesting things about them. Uh, other places are where you've got sort of like a sand drawing robot. This is not, you know, you're not moving around lots of sand. You're just sort of drawing a finger through a pile of sand, like a Zen garden kind of situation. And so in those cases, you're not moving with high forces. You're not moving anything that's spinning at high speed. That's a good application for if there's a little bit of flex in the body, it's not gonna break anything, right? It's gonna, it's gonna still work fine. You won't have major problems. This one down here is a long exposure light painting. If you're, I wish I could zoom in on this right here, but this is an LED right there. And it sort of drags out the shape of the cursive hello. And as it does that, you keep the shutter of a camera open and it will collect that light and get a long exposure thing so that you can see drawings that are made over time. It's a really, that's, that's one of the ones that we're gonna look at a little bit deeper. But this is essentially just moving around an LED. So there's, it's not pushing any weight. It's not carrying anything. It's actual structure is built out of cardboard, which is fascinating. You can build an entire CNC machine out of cardboard, which feels uh, like maybe it shouldn't work, but it totally does. And we're gonna look at examples in just a second. So movement in general is something that we'll need to think about in, in most of our machines that we build over time. There's lots of machines in the space where things move on their own, whether it's the Gerber or the laser or the vinyl cutter or the, the water jet, every one of those has movement as some piece that exists in addition to its end effector. All, none of our machines that I just rattled off, the, the movement isn't usually the output itself. There's like an end effector, like a laser that is, got a final lens and mirror that's being moved. And there's sort of two pieces in tandem, the movement part and the end effector part. And so you need to think about both of those. But getting it to move requires some motors that feels perhaps like an obvious part, but then probably even more, and this is silently there, are all of the components that it takes to make that happen. I brought one of the old, here's, here it is. I'm gonna put it, let's point the camera this way briefly. Uh, and I know this is not gonna be big, but here's an old 3D printer. We'll look at this later, but there's a whole lot of extra pieces and parts inside of these things that totally are useful for thinking about movement. 
the linear bearings, guide rods, all sorts of things for us to take a look at. So just exploring that is really something that's important. A good example here is that just by looking at this picture, I can tell that this motor is driving this belt right here. This is a passive other side pulley on this particular item. And this is the carriage that would move back and forth with the tool right on it. By looking at this picture also, these are couplers down here. You can tell by the double screws. This one's probably onto the shaft of the motor and this one's onto some sort of a screw. And so this one and this one would move that entire gantry up and down across the machine. And then this one down here at the bottom has got a belt that's probably gonna take that entire brownish platform. Looks like it's made out of MDF forward and back along the machine. So just by looking at them and how they're mechanically connected, you can start to imagine like what each motor is responsible for and how that goes. And then once you've got those mechanisms in place, you can look at many examples and try and use those features for your own sorts of design. But first we need to know some of those, some of those works. Like over here, we've got bearings. You've probably all seen bearings before. They've got small rollers, whether they're spheres or sometimes they're cylinders to ease movement. These have come down drastically in price over the past several years. It was about the time that fidget spinners proliferated. Those things came into existence because all of a sudden the price of bearings just dropped through the floor. And so they became very cheap things that you could put three or four of them into a little kid's toy and sell it for $3, right? That that, that became possible because bearings got very, very cheap. But there's lots of different versions of bearings. There's, this is the sort of standard ball bearing. There's sealed ones, there's unsealed ones. There's roller bearings like this. This is a special kind of thrust bearing that keeps, uh, if you've got a metal lathe, this is gonna be a part of your metal lathe. There's also linear bearings, which are these cylinder things. They almost always look like this or like this. And those move along a rod lengthwise. They're, they can spin, but mostly they're for the linear motion along that rod. And those are really helpful for if you wanna have an axis move to have it move in a specified direction. Bushings are another good move. And this is probably something that we're gonna play around with quite a bit. Uh, these are relatively cheap if you don't have linear bearings on hand. That's like a nylon little piece that you could also put on a linear rod and have it move pretty easily with some of those. They're, they're relatively cheap. And as long as they slide easily, this totally works. And then you can also play with, whoops, you can play with belts. Belts like this are really nice ways to add motion. Uh, they sell them in lots of kits nowadays because 3D printers often break at the belt. So on Amazon, I bought one a couple of weeks ago because I was thinking about building a sand table. Would totally contribute it if there's a sand table being built. Um, but you can buy kits just like this with a couple of drive pulleys, a couple of passive pulleys with little bearings inside, and then some tensioning springs so that the whole belt stays tight. This is totally a thing. Oftentimes you'll mount the two ends of a belt like that onto a carriage so that it moves back and forth. There's, there's lots of different places where if you're looking at the details of a machine, these features will start to pop out at you. And then there's also brackets. Brackets are really a, a custom bracket is a really important term to think about and have as a concept or an idea. This is a bracket that I put into my bar robot uh, where I designed it and then 3D printed it to hold motors down. And so it's not, you know, it's nothing too wild or crazy. There were these, these pump motors that I wanted to install and they have this little face plate. And I thought if I replaced that and joined it in such a way that I could screw the motor down to a, to a surface, I would be able to integrate them and do sort of two jobs at once instead of just the weird trying a prism thing shape that they give you with the piece as a stock part. And it worked out pretty well having a custom bracket. I needed to install 12 of these. so making one design that I could print 12 times was really, really helpful. So thinking about brackets like that for how do you wanna screw things together? How do you wanna attach things that maybe shouldn't attach normally? That can be really helpful. Uh, and it's something that is totally worth looking into. This is, this is a, you know, that, that piece is maybe an inch and a half by three quarters of an inch, a couple of centimeters in, in either direction. And it works really nicely to be able to have these sorts of connection points come together. These are sorts of things that if you're building a larger machine, you may need to think about, do I need to make a bracket? Do I need to make a, maybe a plate that you laser cut some screw holes into so you can screw things together? Those sorts of strategies can be really helpful for when you're joining pieces together. 
let's say if you're building a garden, a garden watering system, and you want to have four pumps all lined up, you might need something like this. Or maybe you mount your motors in such a way that you can screw them right to the plate. There's a lot of ways to solve this problem. This is just one, one possible solution. But it's really it's good to have a digital design, especially if you're going to build something like 12 times, because then you can just hit print and it'll come again and again. What's up, Ruby? Oh, yeah, good, good point. Um, a de facto dictionary. Motor parts are what we're talking about next week. And so the big, the big takeaway for motor parts is that there is, and it's going to be the main focus of motor parts, is how you get movement to happen. Uh, and that's the short answer is if you want to have uh, only control over go or stop or maybe speed, that's a, a DC motor, a brushed motor. And that's like a, these pumps are actually, you can see there's two wires running in. Those are just uh, regular DC brush motors. There's stepper motors. Those are the ones inside of a 3D printer that lets you go a specified distance and you can control it. You can say move forward 14 steps and it will do that. It could stop and turn around and go the other way. I, I think um, I think I may have just misspoke basically. Oh. I, I was um, in the previous slide, like when you yeah. were talking about bushings and bearings, I, yeah. I I'm, I'm, I, what I meant, uh, were these, right? Like, oh, cause yeah. I would, I would love to like, it's like, you know, that thing that's attached to this thing that's attached to the motor. Uh, I would love to, to know how to, how to better describe and relate to these components. That is a really, you know, the, honestly, one of the best ways, if you're just looking for some of the words that you'd like to have, uh -huh. um, McMaster car is really a winner because of how picture driven their entire website is. Okay, you can, great. You can really see lots of like here, here we go. Oh, yeah. pulling it. It, it's all sort of visual. I really like to come to here and if ah. I need, yeah, I know, like look at, you click on screws and bolts and then you get this entire page that's just like, oh, these are all the words that I've wanted to know for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a sales site and it's this, this is literally exactly what i was looking for so okay this, that that is terrific thank you yeah it's super helpful uh what's up kate camera is still backwards okay are we no, here we go we're back to i'm this is okay all right we're doing fine totally fine you can buy a whole screw conveyor on mcmaster look at all that the, here's reference charts the whole bit you could there the amount of things that you can get on McMaster is really, truly mind blowing. Uh, and the shipping is really good, really fast, rather. The, the price is a little bit higher. One of the strategies, and we're gonna talk about this later, one of the strategies I employ is I look at, uh, I look at all these things on McMaster. And then if, if I, I check the prices other places to see if it's astronomically different, if it's similar, and it depends on how many I'm buying, sort of where I'm gonna buy them from. And Fusion 360 will also import most of the time in McMaster, like let's say that I would like to work with um, a hex screw and a particular hex screw, like maybe this one, and I'm looking at that one specifically. This one has a CAD model, so I can go into the product detail and I can specifically import the CAD model for SolidWorks or one of these is going to be for Fusion 360. So you can specifically import those models directly into Fusion 360 if you really wanted to cover all of that detail in your 3D design, which is a lot of detail to, to have, but it can be really, really helpful instead of having to try and model the bolt, you get all of the dimensions perfectly right. So it's, an, it's a really great resource to have all of these words, but these are just like four big players that you should definitely know exist. Uh, and then brackets are really helpful. This is the cardboard system that I was talking about a little bit earlier. I knew that this was coming up. This is, uh, it was in 2015, uh, James Coleman and Nadia Peak, a couple of MIT students came up with this system where it's a cardboard linear motion. So if you're thinking about the laser, it moves in two dimensions, right? It's got its X and its Y dimension. Each cardboard stage here is one of those two dimensions and you can put them together. If you, and so down here in the bottom, there's two stacked. So it would be able to move left and right across this black one and up and down across the green one on this. This is Office Depot science poster cardboard, laser cut and folded into this shape with a uh, 3D printer motor with an integrated uh, lead screw on it. 
This is, these are things that I'm 100% certain we have this motor in the back and then we can attach this motor in. This is a very lightweight, relatively quick thing. You can laser cut and have yourself a one dimensional CNC motion really, really quickly. There's an entire design and instruction guide here where they walk you through, like here's the cutout, the cut files. They have how you build them. They have all these suggestions for how you might arrange them so you can get motion in different dimensions. They have rotary stages, which are the little spinny looking, the little square ones. They also have lots of different arrangements that you could use, a bunch of examples that you can see. And their system was built to work with a specific control board. We can totally order and make if we wanna use theirs, but we can also use other electronic control systems if, if we're interested. So there's, there's a bunch of different ways that you can make a system like this work. Uh, but this is a, a way that's surprisingly fast, like in an afternoon, if you have all the components, you can easily build two or three of these and have full three-dimensional motion that's pretty well controlled, which is kind of mind blowing. What's up? This, so this is, the cardboard is more for prototyping and for our shared group class project, this would be totally adequate. You, especially for something that moves around very low weight, like light painting, if this was it, that would be totally reasonable. It would give you sort of a 25 by 25 centimeter range where you could draw your picture. Uh, and, you know, we could, we could build it in such a way that it's nice and stable like that. There's also, you can totally scale this up. The last time I worked with this system, I designed in sort of roughly how this went and knew that the, I, was, I was building a robotic hand dipped candle making machine. So there was a hot wax container and it was dipping a wick into green and then white hot wax so that it would build up a candle like you might in an old timey, uh, in an old timey sort of way. But I knew it wouldn't handle it, these cardboard things. So I redesigned, once I had these and had sort of felt them and learned how they worked, then I redesigned the whole thing out of wood and it, and it got much stronger, right? There I needed a little bit more rigidity because the, the loads that I was carrying were higher. So you can totally do that. Uh, and these can be a great way to spin that up. But this is all designed in Rido. The model's parametric. So we can adjust it around how we want. That's, that's totally possible. Um, let's, let's see, robotic old timey. It is, I mean, trying to explain that machine, I build a robot to hand make uh, candles is really, it doesn't, it doesn't even make sense. But in here, let's see, function F11. There's, there's lots of ways to build these. This is sort of the traditional, you've got lots of pieces and parts, you have fully linear motion and it's controlled by these two aluminum shafts and then some bushings that go along them. This totally works as a way to build something. But then there's other ways to do it, to, to build mechanisms too. Online, there's this 507 animated mechanisms, which is a fascinating resource to just sort of stare at for a while to try and learn about new mechanisms it's this, it's this old guidebook that was turned into a website on how that works. There's also compliant mechanisms that are really interesting. NASA used this one. So you could have two side, mode and mounter, side mounted motors to tilt the pitch and yaw of a, of a jet thruster. So like decide so that you could use these motors here on the sides to change the angle of this platform. And then you're pushing gases out into space to to navigate and adjust the pitch and yaw of your spacecraft. There's this one where instead of having the linear bearings, you still, you can see these motors with the long lead screws attached. In this case, you're using those folds as a way to control the motion so that it stays vertically up and down. By having those controlled bends in certain ways, that's actually enough to guide the motion of the middle section up and down only and to keep it from really going too far off track. Which is, which is kind of wild that you can use that. The, the one that's in the back, I believe is rigid, is straight up and down. And then the other three just sort of let this move along that path. It's a neat one if you can find a video of one of those mechanisms. And I'm definitely gonna be just posting a ton of videos of mechanisms to foundations over the next several days. But the, the big lesson here is that there's no right way to build any machine. There's lots and lots and lots of different ways. And there's ways that we've conventionally settled on but even, even if you're looking at like the biggest machines that most of us interact with on a daily basis on, for cars, 
there's a lot of consensus around the six cylinder V engine, but that is not the only type of engine that exists. There's the weird Wankel engine. That's like a spinny, not quite triangle sort of shape engine inside of Mazdas for a while. There's the inline engine, there's diesel engines versus gasoline. There's a ton of different variants in how me mechanisms, even the biggest ones that we pay a lot of money for on a regular basis, get designed and used. So there's, don't feel like there's one answer to this. There's going to be many ways to do this. And it can be really interesting to see sort of what outcomes there are. And, and if you've got something that's really creative, that mechanism on its own can be fascinating and mesmerizing. I've seen, there's a, if you haven't seen it ever, there's a monorail 3D printer with three arms that's really fascinating. Somebody's trying really hard to make it a thing where it's three linear bearings and a few bent arms that are being used to print in three dimensions, even though they're all three axes are controlled by a one dimensional motion. It's bizarre, but really a fascinating thing to watch. So, the, you know, those are lots of the ideas that we're gonna try and explore. There's tons of different options for mechanisms and that's probably less helpful than, uh, than other things that I've had to say, just because there's so many options, right? There's, there's a ton of, this is not an easily buttoned up, this is the one way to do the thing kind of week or unit. There's a lot of opportunity and this is where talking about it is really helpful as a group. But one of the pieces uh, is just understanding your hardware. And so looking at McMaster is a good way to get started and understanding technical specifications can be really helpful. And it's, you're, no one's an expert in all of them except for maybe Lior, but beyond him, the rest of us all need to look them up as we're getting reoriented. So a common bolt is a quarter 20 bolt, a quarter 20 screw. And those two numbers have, a, have some specification about the screw. The quarter tells you about its nominal shaft size. So it's about a quarter inch in diameter. And the 20 is 20 threads per inch. So along a, an inch long length of the bolt, it's got 20 threads wrapped around it if you were to count them up. It's different than how the metric system is when you have an M8 uh, screw. And I think it's maybe eight. I'm, I'm not sure what the thread counts are, but it's the diameter versus the distance in millimeters between threads. It's a very much more reasonable system than our English system, as most metric measurements are. Sorry. Uh, power supplies, though, have their own technical specifications. If you're buying a 5 volt, 2,500 milliamp supply, it's probably for a Raspberry Pi 4. Just buy the amount. It's either for that or the other place where that sort of a size is going to be used is for like an iPad Pro charger. Like for a you need to have over two amps of charging for the big iPads because they use up their energy so quickly with that large display. And then even more so if they have a, a larger processor. So you can, like I can tell on the electronic side, sort of relatively what ballpark you're in based on the scale of current along with voltage. Five volts is standard for USB. And this is a pretty high current. Um, a normal wall charger for a phone in the olden days was a thousand milliamps. A laptop port is about 500 milliamps. And then this is a beefy one for a, a big demand. But starting to learn those, you won't necessarily have an intuitive sense for what all those specifications are, but learning to not ignore them when you're going to buy something is really probably the first important step. Then you start to see them everywhere. And when you're, when you're standing in the hardware aisle at, at Lowe's or Home Depot, all of a sudden, you see all those numbers and you're like, oh, this is not just a wall of mystery anymore. Those, once those start to click, you'll all of a sudden start to make sense of what all those specifications are and what they mean. Not to mention all the head styles, all the different th thread pitch things that you can learn. Uh, there's no way that we're going to cover all of these technical specifications, but they're definitely something to think about if you need to buy a particular type of screw. Now, uh, so how do you order those? McMaster is probably the, the easiest way to get the exactly right thing made of the exactly right material, made to the correct military standard. If you wanna buy the perfect part, McMaster is probably the way to go. But then across the bottom, there's Amazon, Ace Hardware, of, of all the hardware stores, there's many options. And then Alibaba, right? Or eBay, or, or any of those different places that you might buy something. There's lots of different factors to consider there. One of the things that we've learned over the course of foundations is that if you need to order a part, and it's a week long lesson, a week long unit, you're kind of pressed for time because you're waiting that long to make it happen. 
in, uh, so there's a couple of important details. One is if you can standardize hardware for yourself, do it. If you're gonna say, we're gonna only use M4 screws the entire time, make that happen for yourself. You can buy one kit of M4 screws and your, your project will get easier. I've definitely done that on projects that I've done. Set myself a standard for within the project so I'm not buying a bunch of different sizes. Another thing that can be really helpful is that Make Haven in the back, there's many, many members who have bought that box because they needed three screws of a certain type and size, and then they just leave the box here, which is great. There's a treasure trove in the back of all sorts of different sizes of nuts and bolts and things that are leftovers that you're welcome to pick through. And so if you can read the, the tea leaves of all, and Kate's saying goodies is another, is another place to get all of those sorts of things, that's good. Uh, it's a local, I don't even know, is this, it's a local thing. Oh, the local shop where the people know everything is magic. Yeah, yeah, totally. So goodies is what I'm hearing is the place to go. If you wanna physically go somewhere and get some help. Uh, Cause finding a person who works there that also knows what's going on is a real win. Um, but you, you know, you can also sort of scrounge through the back, which is totally a thing. But what we're gonna try and start with is how to retrofit hardware. So we're gonna try and retrofit an old 3D printer. And the good news is, is that you can also, there's plenty of code systems out there that you can also start to retrofit also. So in addition to that, if you're trying to build the CNC light painter, it turns out Easel, the same product that's used with the Shipoko, has in it, you can choose whether you're using the Shipoko 2, whether you're using one of the, the Carvey or a couple other machines by them. And one of them, one of the options that they give you for the machine that's available to select is a Arduino with Gerbil. And so you can install Gerbil firmware, which is just like a software thing onto an Arduino, and then it's ready to go to control a CNC. And actually, if you, if you take a good look at the Shapoko box, it's just run by an Arduino. That's it. It's, there's no like secret sauce hidden inside there. It's just an Arduino pod project for that Shapoko. So we could, a very reasonable project would be to upgrade the Shapoko or to try and recreate it. Those are all very possible things. And even you can even use Easel to do that control structure where if you're trying to just rebuild a Shapoko for yourself from a few raw parts, you could, you could really have very little pushback on the code, just installing the software that they use and, and not fighting against it to make any weird specialty configurations. Whoops. But it's totally something that you can do. Uh, the, the days of MacGyver are probably, you know, if you find a MacGyver-like project where there's zero code at all, it's just like a handful of things you can sort of put together with used gum and some, and some duct tape, that's a magical moment. A lot, of our, a lot of our machines are probably going to take some level of code and automation. So we're gonna to have to think about that. Even if, even if it's not uh, the highest end, most advanced code in the world, it's still probably, if there's gonna be motion, there's gonna be some control. Uh, there's some level of code that we're gonna to have to write in. So we'll have to think about that a little bit as a piece of our structure. But our plan for the week. So taking these ideas and how do you actually do something with them is a really important question. Like what, what do you make happen? So this is a rough outline of what I think would be reasonable to have happened this week. And so hopefully this is where, where it goes, but it is worth mentioning for a, few, for a few reasons that this is the first of four weeks of the machine building unit. There's like machine building and mechanism building. Those are sort of blended together, I guess. Maybe I'll make them one big unit in the future. But uh, we're gonna do four, four weeks in a row on the group project. And so this is the start of that work. So you're gonna be working with these people over a sustained period of time to do this project, to begin building, to turn it into something. And then hopefully at the end, we have something that's brought into fruition. And I would say definitely try and get it, if there's four weeks available, try and get it done in three. You wanna have that last week for some flex time because things are gonna go wrong. We, this, we know how this plays. This is not our first rodeo. And so giving yourself some extra time is gonna be really helpful. Also, if magically everything works the first time, you stick the landing, you get a full, uh, a full 10.0 score, great. That's not that we're gonna score it, you're just thinking gymnastics. Uh, but in, if you totally do it, then you get an extra week of time to work on your final projects. Because right after this, we're gonna transition into three weeks 
where we talk about more sort of conceptual things and it's just time where you can express yourself through all of these ideas and through through a project of your own choosing. There's a lot, and that, that has a lot of things. That means that we've entered the phase of the course where we're starting to think about like the big picture and, and how do we close, close this all up. Um, and as I'm thinking about it, as I'm wondering about what that means for the end of the course, part of what I'm thinking about is I wanna make sure that everybody has a chance to prove that they've got all these skills, right? We said early, very, very early on that you're gonna have a certificate and a portfolio. And the portfolio is, you know, it's been a little while and there's, there's no real reason why it has to be presented one way or the other. But what we really want for a portfolio for each of you is that you can demonstrate that I've done each of these things. So as we think about like, what are the next steps? What are the roles that you're gonna take on? There's some strategy in how you choose to help the team. Maybe you lean in to the areas of your strength and you say, I've, I wanna be the most productive. I wanna make sure that we push forward so that I can get to my things and everybody can get to their things afterwards. That's a reasonable strategy. Or maybe you say, I wanna really team up with somebody and work hard on the Arduino stuff because that's an area of growth that I know for myself. And I wanna make sure that I lean into it here when there's people around for some support. There's, there's a lot of strategies that you could employ moving forward over the next several weeks to think about that, but it's definitely something that you're gonna to wanna to think about, talk about with your group, talk about with me, make sure that we're all headed in the right direction, that people can meet their goals for what's going on. But the group, the group project is a good moment to pause and think about sort of where you're going and, and what you want the end of the course to look like for yourself, which is, which is a bit more philosophical than you might've thought it was going to be when you showed up today for this. Uh, so we've definitely got some pieces to think about and some good conversations to have. Uh, and and I, I feel like we're entering that phase of the, of the pandemic and people being vaccinated that maybe there's some socializing that needs to happen. So we can have these in sort of relaxed conversations that are maybe not as tense as like, I need to wait for the print to finish so that I can do the next thing. So we can, we can try and, and have more relaxed conversations about it. Uh, but that, that said, big things that we need to make sure happen is let's let's pick groups. And I think mostly that's going to be something that's based around schedules and not so much a hard border on groups, but like a, what do you plan to be working on the most and how can you take responsibility for pieces and parts? And mostly that's probably gonna be based on schedules. My guess is that they'll probably be, we, we probably organically fit into a set of four weekend warriors who wanna do all their stuff on the weekend when they're not like half paying attention to work and a group of weeknight, like nice and slow, a couple hours a day, a few days a week, that, you know, those two sorts of camps that people would wanna land in. I, I don't know if that's gonna be real, what's gonna happen. We're gonna see what happens with conversations in a few minutes, but it's worth it to start to think about that. Then to decide on a machine to build. I was saying maybe gardening and light painting, but I guess I haven't even really defined what light painting is. I'm going to in a minute. Uh, then have a conversation about it. And this week would definitely be a good moment to have those first proof of concept tests. So if you're building a 3D printer, could you heat up and extrude plastic? Could you make that happen? Would it cool and turn into something that was solid? That's the sort of test that you'd wanna do. If it's the garden pump, then you wanna, can you move water around with a pump? I have a few pumps laying around at home. We can, we can try and fire them up. If you wanna do the light painting thing, can you make light? Can you control whether it blinks blue or green? all those sorts of things, those proof of concept kind of ideas are really good to do early and to start thinking about. Allocating roles can be really helpful. If you've got a team or a group that's pretty well defined, you know you wanna work on a thing, then having people who are responsible for certain parts helps move the project forward. I, and maybe that's something, I don't know what sort of businesses you've been a part of, but I like to have roles in a group. It helps define what I'm trying to do and who I need to talk to about one particular issue or another. So that could be helpful for your group, but that's the thing you can totally talk about. And then the last thing is that definitely this week you should begin building. It's, it should not be conceptual only. With three weeks to make this whole, th three or four weeks to make this whole thing happen, you wanna get on it. You don't wanna be, you don't wanna come up with on Sunday evening, you're saying, ah, oh, I wonder what the first step should be. Is gonna really put you in a bad place over the next little while. Uh, the last time I did a project like this with people, it, it was delayed and it was much more stressful than had we gone on it early. I definitely would recommend that you go for it and you get after it as soon as you can. We'll be able to, I, I imagine foundations 
hashtag foundations on Slack will be a flurry of activity over the next several weeks. But in here, here are four possible team member roles that you might wanna take on. And not every role will be equally busy all the time. We're not looking for fair distribution of work. That's, that's not, you know, this isn't a business where don't try and equate it to that. Uh, but we've got maybe a design and structure role. Someone who's trying to think about this, the big picture of the machine and sort of how do you build the pieces and parts? Are you gonna, do you need to cut wood? Do you need to design some laser cut things? Are you gonna lay it out on a, on a single board? Are you gonna use a set of ropes and pulleys to move stuff around? How are you gonna make that happen? Then somebody who's working on the code and how do you control it, the interface? Somebody who's working on the active parts, how do you control the LED that blinks? How do you make the pumps fire when they need to? And then somebody who's documenting and taking photos, which is, we've definitely learned over time is it takes focused effort to do that. So we wanna make sure that each one of those roles are all important, that they all get some play. Maybe as a group, you decide everybody just sort of document as you go and we're gonna split up the work and I'm gonna do this, and you're gonna do that, and then we go from there. Uh, but this is definitely something to think about. The, I talked about the tragedy of the commons earlier. It's that if, if no one's responsible, if everyone's responsible for something, that kind of means no one's responsible for something. It's a, it's a major lesson and certainly you can, I'll send out a thing about the tragedy of the commons in foundations chat after this. Uh, a little TED ed. It's something that we, when I taught environmental science, it's a big concept in there for everyone's responsible and no one's responsible. It's, it's a little sad. So the next steps, it's 7.59. The next thing would be to think about groups. Would you wanna be a weekend warrior or are the weeknights sort of your jam? How does that work? We're gonna have a big open conversation to try and figure this out. 